Ladies and gentlemen, um, dear hosts, my, uh, my intention is to provoke you first. This is um, what my paper is about, and I try to be quite um, serious to the time frame that was um, uh, mentioned by the organizers. So please uh, clock me if I'm into 20 minutes. It is about migration, and it starts with figures because migration is generally about figures first. This is what comes to our eyes. And figures can offer a clear dimensional image of the amplitude of the phenomenon. So here are the grim statistics. And the data I will quote are available for October this year. In 2015, all in all, in Europe, there, was, there were 1,011,712 migrants, out of which 3,777 3, died on their way to Europe. In 2016, statistics mention 332,000 46 migrants by 31st October, out of which 3,930 people have lost their lives. So I repeat, one, roughly 1.01 million 2015, and roughly 3.8 thousand dead. This year, 330 migrants, 1,000 migrants, out of which 3.9 thousand dead. It's a paradox. Although the number of migrants has decreased to almost a quarter of the total of 2015, the number of victims stays at the same level, which means more than 12 victims per day. The darkest record in 2016 belongs to Italy. 3,453 victims out of a total of 157,049 migrants, followed by Greece with 415 people who lost their lives out of 169,524 migrants, and then Spain with 62 people who lost their lives out of 5,445 migrants. Most of those who embarked upon the dangerous journey to Italy this year were from Nigeria, Eritrea, Sudan, Gambia, Ivory Coast, Guinea, Somalia, and Mali, whereas the migrants arriving on the coast of Greece were mostly from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, and Iran. Although less consistent than throughout 2015, the migrants' wave is still numerically significant and the journey becomes more and more perilous. It is, it is the attraction for Europe, for personal safety and better choices of life, that makes people take the roads westwards or navigate across the Mediterranean northwards, no matter the dangers ahead, no matter the costs, no matter the daily risks they have to confront. I will not go into the reasons, the origins of migration. It will take us quite a lot of time. Let's jump over this episode and think what awaits for them at the European end of the journey. In 2015, there were 1.1 million migrants arriving in Germany, and out of them, 450, 450,000 try to lead a life on their own, waiting for an, an administrative decision related to their status. Half out of them have officially became refugees. But 40% from the total await for expulsion decisions. 45,000 individuals have required to be included in return programs, whereas 
35,000 have already been forcibly expelled home since January 1st, 2016. What happens in France? In France, the third most likely destination after Germany and Sweden, 80,075 migrants have asked for international asylum and protection. In 2015, that is 24% more than in 2014, and the number has increased with 25% in the first month of this year. Most of them are Syrians, Sudanese, and Afghans. This year, another 30,700 migrants were relocated in France from EU countries where asylum capacities were unfit for the large influx of migrants like Greece and Italy. And here comes the problem. France has only 50, 57,500 plus de Bergemont, which is far below its less than 40% capacity, far below the asylum expectations of the, re of the recent migrants. This is one of the reasons we all witnessed how hell can be recreated on Earth, and I refer to the jungle of Calais. By its dismantlement in October, the camp was hosting approximately 9,000 migrants, among which there were 900 abandoned or lost miners, desperately trying to pass into the UK. All these figures speak differently for European Borgen guards or European policemen, for European civil employees dealing with migrants, and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, the figures hide deep and lasting emotions which are translatable in all European and non-European cultures. That is, incertitude, insecurity, grief, bereavement, tragic death. This is what they have encountered on the road. This is what they have seen and witnessed. It is not difficult to understand why these emotions would run high when realizing that by the end of the journey, they would be confronted with discrimination, anger, frustration, xenophobia, and above all, lack of cultural tolerance. The feeling of insecurity that's been spoken about today and yesterday is all pervasive in Europe today due to terrorist attacks and to sheer political and mediatic mismanagement of the impact the migrants' fluxes might have had upon local cultural sensitivities, rules, customs, and constraints. It is noteworthy taking into account this feeling of insecurity which affects all European citizens, it is noteworthy the fact that the number of small guns legally or and illegally detained by Western EU citizens from Germany, France, Sweden, Italy, Greece is growing yearly by a 52% rate. The number of illegal guns today in these countries runs into 4 million whereas the amount of legally detained guns, small guns, is into 900,000. Somebody's getting quite a serious amount of money out of this. It is well known that individuals who migrate experience multiple stresses that can impact their mental well-being, including the loss of cultural norms religious customs and social support systems, adjustment to a new, new culture, and changes in identity and in the concept of self. And there's, there are recent researchers which have serious arguments about how rates of mental illnesses among patients, migrant patients, are increased in some migrant groups and therefore are to be acknowledged for an increase in recent individual amok violent behavior cases, like in Germany this, the last six months. In so far, 
the cultural difference is translated into aggressive behavior, it is likely that violence against locals will stir up violence against migrants. Is there a way out of this spiral of reciprocal violence? How can we consequently prevent a radical political response aiming at casting out migrants, expelling them from the communities they found a new home therein? How can we ease the processes of integration? I'm not discussing politics here. And the solution, for as far as I know, is basically cultural, but with a twist. And there are two rationales that will help us reach a conclusion. The first, we need to acknowledge the results of recent research conducted on migration and the guiding principles and policy stances governments should take into account. For example, it has been proven that, quote, the core cause of European integration problems may in fact be socioeconomic in nature than religious. Poverty and exclusion, above all, fuel the politicization of cultural differences, yet identity remains paramount in public debates." Unquote. While protecting the majority culture, the so-called gentle pluralism, governments should fight discrimination, preserve, preserve freedom of expression at all social levels, and seek solutions to integration into labor markets, into educational systems, Promoting social cohesion by rules and norms, although a worthy goal, may not be very efficient in the short run. In other words, jobs for migrants. Favoring startup investments and advocating for co-participation in easing the integration process. The second rationale. Migrants have always contributed to the host culture and have significantly influenced aesthetic criteria cultural norms, and attitudes towards culture. Quote, immigrants have had an impact on the cultural contexts in European societies in various ways. One obvious, one obvious area concerns the changing food production and consumption patterns. Another area concerns sports. The impact becomes obvious when one looks at the activities of migrants in amateur sport associations and clubs, in professional sport associations and clubs, but also when one analyzes the impact of migrants on the professional sports industry in general. Just look at the football team players. For those who do not know, the national football team of France, at the last world championship, was 90% composed of former migrants or sons of former migrants. A third area concerns fashion. Every day, cultural change takes place with regard to fashion, and immigration has greatly influenced the changes in the last decades. This can also be said in other areas of the civitas, most notably in the arts, music, media. And I quote this from a thorough research on this matter. And I could add jokingly, pizza. We all know what pizza is. Pizza was not on the menu list until the, until the years when hundreds of thousands of Italian immigrants entered Western Europe seeking for a job northwards. And that is the moment when pizza became fashionable. Otherwise, it was just a petty provincial dish. And I would provoke you further and ask you to go 300 meters far from this spot. And you will meet one of the 553 Afghan restaurants in Berlin. Shall I ask who has ever taken Chinese dish for lunch or for dinner? Do you like sushi? That's because 
of immigrants. If there is a chance to aim for integration by using the migrants' cultural peculiarities and, and backdrop, then it should be seized as such. It will work both ways, for the hosts and for the immigrants. Cultural diplomacy in this respect could get a far more enriching meaning. It would work cross-culturally as platform for an exchange of experience about cultural integration attempts between countries and cultures exposed to diversity and difference. And I just give you some examples. How could it work? The countries of origin for immigration are not unknown to us. Their cultures, in a broader sense, are quite familiar to Europeans since the 18th century at least. Cultural diplomacy could help charting local elements of culture that may be then translated into a syncretic cultural project with an immediate economic outcome. What is peculiar in Ghana could be then translated into European culture and become the reason for an economic startup. Experiences need to be shared between the EU host countries and entrance point countries like Greece and Italy, where the influx of immigrants is large and continuous. Rapid merging, and this is the stage two, rapid merging into the labor market could provide the necessary impetus for a thorough and less traumatic integration. What does this mean? Charting cultural differences, see which of them can be put into the European culture or into European cultures in general. And I just quoted some of the fields of activity well, where these inputs, non-European inputs, can find a fertile ground and then they can be translated, with the help of governments, certainly, into economic activities, thus offering the roots all immigrants need and the motivation, therefore. In the end, it is about creating jobs with a minimal implication of the host country. When I say minimal implication, it's about financial arrangements like quick crediting, startup, small investment, etc. But it is about jobs coming from acknowledging a lucrative cultural difference. Playing on what is at hand for immigrants, and that is their original culture in all its aspect, aspects. In fact, immigrants arriving on the coast of Greece or on the coast of Italy do not have almost anything with them except their clothes and their culture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ungarian. If you are prepared to take a few questions, at least two. I, I hope, I hope I, ha I can have the answer. Dr. Babuna. Hello, my name is Oktar Babuna. I'm a neurosurgeon from Turkey, TV channel A9. Migration is a big problem, of course, and according to the United Nations High Commission for Refugee uh, Crisis, uh, the 2014 numbers are about 60 million who abandoned their homes, actually. So Turkey, the, where I'm coming from, has opened the doors. Three million mm -hmm. refugees are in Turkey, mm -hmm. uh, in Jordan, in Lebanon. Uh, the minister said yesterday 2.5 uh, <coughs> million, actually. I don't think this is a favor. This is very humane. Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, said it's humane and moral obligation to accept these people because their life is endangered. However, we have to find a long-term solution. Mm -hmm. This is a short-term emergency situation, but in the long term, we have to stop the wars. We have to eradicate radicalism, terrorism, and violence. There are two sides. The foreign powers military intervention, they call themselves saviors, and then the radicals and terrorist organization, they call themselves saviors also, and it's in a vicious cycle. We have to ally good people, cultural democracy, um, uh, cultural diplomacy, moral diplomacy is also needed. And we have to eradicate the ideology of the violence and find a long-term solution also. Thank you. I fully agree with you, sir. The problem is that apart from this basic explanation of what is happening now very close to us, 
because Aleppo is pretty close. Um, you're absolutely right. The problem is what and how can we deal with the situation here in Europe? I'm not about politics in this very moment. I could speak a lot about politics, but I indulge myself into not referring to politics, but into referring to presumptive solutions to the situation of those poor people when reaching Europe. Because if we do not do anything, this is like feeding the monster of radicalism and violence. On the other hand, we do have our own rules and customs and norms. They can blend in. It is absolutely possible. But this cannot be done by administrative measures, like, for example, banning the burqa. But when putting, giving someone who comes to Europe fed with hope, giving him the possibility to start something that would, could feed him. And then he will blend in, step by step. We witnessed this kind of mechanism for 60 years, no matter the origin of the migrants. They had post-Second World War migrants, Germans coming from East Prussia, trying to blend in into Western Germany. Russians coming in the 50s and the 60s. Italians coming. Swedes and Scandinavians trying to reach Germany in the 60s. Spanish trying to reach Western Europe in the 60s and in the 70s. Then East European, Yugoslav first, and then all sorts of other Eastern European citizens. This is normal to us. And it's like contradicting the very experienced nature of our own European history when saying, no, we don't need you. No, it's how can you blend in? And that is the proper answer. Otherwise, we're not talking about politics. We're talking about exclusion. And exclusion is not what we should wish for today. Thank you very much. We are going to take an, another question, this time from Africa. Uh, no. <laughs> it's fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and it's from the Caribbean as well. Okay, um, Caribbean. My question, James from the UK. Uh, you gave a great um, speech, um, but your speech lacked uh, case studies. Um, I attended a, another conference and Sweden was a fantastic example of a country which has integrated people, has passporting schemes to get um, migrants, especially Syrians, into work, skilled migrants as well. And of course the UK, which has over the years absorbed a number of um, immigrants, migrants, refugees, and as an observer in, in Europe, you don't see the level of um, deprivation or migrants on the streets as you do um, in other in European capitals as you and you wouldn't see that in the UK you have we do have homelessness but it's not necessarily distributed among people who have come to the country are there any good examples and do you know of a way forward for for the EU or European countries to absorb or better absorb migrants thanks it's difficult to make I think it's quite difficult to make a sort of a catalog which country is more open to difference in trying to accustom newcomers to its own cultural environment. It's, um, it's, like, it's like in a tango, it takes two. It takes a host culture which is open and has been exposed to difference for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the, on the other side, the newcomer who should understand that through a basic pedagogy that there are norms, rules, legislation he has to abide to. But this is not impossible. My, fee, my, my, my fear is that not the migrants should be put under the question mark. Because what they hope for 
is to at least either get out of the conflict for a limited period of time, and then they would hope to go back home, or make a living somewhere else on their own forces for themselves and for their family. The problem is how can we confront ourselves when looking into the mirror of our capacity? How can we confront ourselves? How can we confront our? Uh, 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 how can we confront ourselves in the terms of the culture of fear that we're growing now within ourselves? This is why I quoted that statistics about the small guns, because it's absolutely clear that not at political level, but at basic level, the culture of fear is growing steadily, and it's very thick. When acquiring a small gun, then you know at least one basic thing. When you fire at somebody, then it's a life in line. You don't fire just for fun. So this is, this is actually my, my, my question. Is there another way that, would be, that could be experienced at the level of European societies to host migrants by giving them, firstly, the economic chance, and then, step by step, blending them into the host culture? Because it doesn't go like this overnight. Whereas filling some papers for, the, for a credit and then bringing your own, your own business up, that could be that's it workable in a month or so. So it could happen. Thank you, okay. Thank you very much. much for this <laughs> presentation.